I'm doing it live. Ready? I'm ready. All right, I'm ready. Are you ready? I mean, I'm not ready. ready. I would officially like to say that I'm not ready. For the record. For the record. Just skip for just skip the record. The, just skip to the sixties. Welcome and 70s. back. This is Andy with the Poor Proles Almanac, and this is the second of two episodes of the mini series where we're reimagining our future after collapse. Yay! Yay! Not going to join in on that? Yay? Yay. <laughs> so you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us on Patreon if you'd like to help support the show. Uh, we don't explicitly offer any traditional content as a benefit for our patrons. But we do have some limited access content that's kind of more peripheral areas that we like to cover. If you like what we're doing, you'll probably be interested to at least hear what we have to say on the other side. For a real quick second, we're going to give you a quick clip of that. And if you can afford to, please donate on Patreon, uh, Patreon to go uh, get access to that content. So please take a listen. But the, the downfall of this was that, um, as we know today, and they did not know very well then, uh, this actually causes more extreme temperature fl- uh, swings, partly because there's less moisture in the air because of evapotranspiration, which is when essentially the the landscape keeps moisture in the landscape because there's so much plant life less light and heat reflected because there's less ground cover yeah and then the second reason is that trees retain heat and also shield the landscape from the cold and the heat they kind of are like a, essentially insulation to the the ground in the area wherever the woods is Lastly, we're on Instagram and Facebook if you want to follow us over there. We don't just post updates about the show, but we incorporate leftist and ecological history. And, of course, we got... Memes. Whole bunch of memes. Yeah. Uh, This episode is the eighth and last episode of the eight-part miniseries. We kind of did a two-parter at the end. The last episode was about uh, the Syrian revolution, which was full collapse and, like, full-blown civil war. And this one, we're going to lighten it up just a little bit and we're going to talk about what would you call it low grade yeah let's call it that we'll call it a low grade or irregular uh civil war i think was a good word used to describe it yeah and this episode much like that one is going to be a little bit different than the rest of the mini series this mini series has been really focused around taking examples of what's existed uh in different places of the world as models of what could be And in this case, we're kind of circling back to the beginning of that process and instead saying, okay, so how do we get there and what does that look like? So we're not really interested in really fetishizing collapse or anything like that. I know there's a lot of like gloom and doom type shit out there and we're really not into that. The the type of collapse that we have will inevitably impact what's available in terms of resources and infrastructure and all these other things in terms of what that looks like. So it is important to kind of think about what that is. So we at least have an idea of the the different types of frameworks that we're looking at to build within. Right. And I think the idea for this episode is to take a big picture look at the scenario and not really get, well, we'll get caught up in some details, but we're not going to do like an extensive deep dive. I think we're just going to have fun with the conversation. Yeah. So while history can be a guide, generally speaking, it doesn't ever actually repeat itself. We rather see silhouettes of the past play out in real time rather than actually seeing those images play out again and again, uh, which is, I think, something that gets kind of lost in a lot of these conversations when, especially like what's been going on in the last four years about Trump. You know, is he a fascist? How do we compare him to someone like Hitler or whatever? And you can get really tied down in the nuance or like these very, very broad statements that aren't really helpful to that conversation because it's more about like, is he Hitler? Did he do the same exact things or some of the same exact things instead of saying, let's look at the framework of what is going on in terms of consolidation of power and all these other things. And those are much more useful things to look at because that's the infrastructural stuff that'll exist even if Trump is gone which we're hopefully going to find out this week. Who knows? Sure. So getting more to the point of this episode, we are going to talk about, we, we came up with this awesome name for it. We're going to talk about the Troubles in uh, Northern Ireland. And we have our first guest today. Super excited to have her on. Uh, Nash Flynn, everybody welcome. Hi. 
Hi. Hi. Hi. This is now your first time on. You were on one of our prologues. I was. So you are at least familiar with us. I've met you. You've met me. Yes. Uh, one of the things we had talked about before we even started the show was a little bit about uh, the cultural impact of the Irish Civil War and that most people don't know it's called the Troubles for a start. Other people don't even know really what the Irish Civil War is in terms of who's involved. And thirdly, a lot of people love the IRA, but they don't know a whole lot other than that they had car bombs. It's a lot more complicated. And we're going to talk about the, the structural issues that led to a multi-decades long low-grade civil war and kind of how that, again, doesn't necessarily mirror letter to letter what's happening in the United States, but it does offer us uh, again, th those um, those uh, shadows and things like that, that kind of give us indicators that this might be something we're looking at in the future here. And it's funny that you mention uh, mm -hmm. car bombs, because uh, before I started to do some reading about um, this whole situation for this episode, the only thing I knew about the IRA was in movies was these guys knew how to make bombs and they had uh, questionable moral compass because they just wanted to complete their mission and they didn't really care who, who got in the way. And then I started to take a look at this and see it's a thousand year struggle that goes back many, many centuries. And there's a lot of deep seated, you know, angst and anger there. And it all sort of came to a head as the um, world was sort of trying to move forward, I guess. But also at the same time, there was the spirit of 68 sort of these people, the civil rights movement that sort of pushed um, the extremes together. And I kind of we we kind of see that now in the United States. So we're going to talk about yeah. those similarities. And uh, but first, let's get the introduction. First, of... brought to you by car bombs. No, no, yes, no, no, car bombs. They're good for your politicians. We don't condone <laughs> that, binge, binge drinking. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, I, I, don't you feel nice and right at home now? I feel very welcomed. <laughs> yeah, are you Irish? And which side are you from? <laughs> um. Uh. Genealogically, I am Irish. Uh, my family came here uh, probably right at the tail end of the famine. Um, so not super Irish, but... Irish enough to hate the British? Irish enough to hate the British. <laughs> okay. Just we got wanted that. to clarify we got that. that. In common. So, I'm, for I'm, totally different reasons. I'm, I'm black Irish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so first off, thanks for taking the time to come talk to us. I know you do a whole bunch of stuff, history, comedy twitch which i don't know what that is but i've heard about it <laughs> we'll, we'll, um, we'll... i've been told we should get one but i i twitch enough so i don't need a, tw a twitch um extra twitches <laughs> are welcome yes so anyways I, I know you've got a podcast coming up on history so i feel like that's something that maybe if people enjoy this they might want to check that out sure cabin fever comedy which is a comedy show as well i do that I do. sounds awesome yeah, how often do you do the show for Cabin Fever? So Cabin Fever is live every other Saturday on Twitch. I believe our next show is, uh, well, we're recording this on Saturday, so it's not this one. Okay. <laughs> it's the next one, which is like the 19th or something. Awesome. I'm not good at dates. Awesome, awesome. We'll definitely check that out after you listen to our episode, of course. Of course. And um, I managed to lose all my notes in that time. Don't worry. I found them. We're good. <laughs> uh, there was no, no uh, car bombings on my computer. It's going to be a lot of car bombing jokes. You just have to accept it. Uh, <laughs> I will try. <laughs> I just I just can't get down the Baileys, man. I just can't do dairy and booze. It's weird to me. I think I, I've probably never done one in my whole life. Really? I think we should probably stop. I should have car bomb. Is yeah. it too late to go to the store? We'll I was going to say. it right now. I'll wait, go to we've the got store stuff. right now. What do we need? Uh, we don't have Guinness, though. Yeah, See, we, we need, need Guinness. Guinness, Baileys, uh, and Jameson. Yeah, it's the trifecta. We've got two of three. <laughs> That doesn't count. Then it's not a car bomb. It's a shoe bomb. <laughs> wow. I didn't know we were in the Middle East. <laughs> Thank you for making my dark joke very worse. <laughs> yeah. That's what I do. I'm here for it. <laughs> anyway, so, so we're not going to do Irish car bombs because we'll, we have shit to do tonight. We'll table it. Yeah. We'll do those later. Yes. Do you uh, guys want to dive in? Yeah. So let's, uh, let's talk about kind of what this is. So like I said before, people have this image of what um, the Irish Civil War was. Uh, and I think we're at the point, historically speaking, where popular memory for a large proportion of the people that are probably listening to the show that are under 40, they don't really remember it. And that's that's challenging in a couple different ways, because then you rely on pop culture and particularly in America 
the extent of pop culture of the Irish Civil War is the IRA and car bombs, and people don't know why, or they know it's something to do with Thatcher, and that's kind of the extent of it. But the the deep-seated animosity that exists between the British and the Irish stems from something that, comparatively speaking, is much older and deeper than just what you would want to call, I guess, a civil war, Mm -hmm. uh, where there's just a line drawn in the, the ground, and that's not entirely accurate to the populations and things like that. I, I don't want to go too far back in history sure. talking about this because this is just one episode. <laughs> but like, where would you say kind of the, the the first real deep cut that really started what became modern Irish Civil War? So I think um, a lot of historians, um, particularly in Ireland, actually cite the Norman Conquest of Ireland um, in 1169 as the real precursor just to a lot of this relationship. Looking at it, from a non uh, Eurocentric view, I think really the problem does start with Henry VIII, as a lot of our problems really do. Um, modern times, yeah, yeah that I, crazy bastard. I definitely know who that is. <laughs> I know you, George. I, there were so many Georges. You're gonna have to be so, slightly uh, Henry, more Henry VIII collected heads, like it was. Just, yeah, oh, was he guy. had the he had the like billion wives. That, oh, he was the guy that wives. Like, yeah, yeah, wanted sons. Didn't get um, body count was pr- pretty too high. high. Pretty, too high. It was pretty high. Um, I do know that. Yeah. I'm not a huge historian. That's why we have Nash on. Yeah. <laughs> but I do know Henry VIII was uh, pretty bloodthirsty. Uh, it's and- been cited that the one of the precursors for a lot of this is from the bollocks of Henry VIII. So for ah. American listeners, that's his balls. Yeah. He really, want, really wanted sons. He had angry, he had angry balls. <laughs> and Chesticles. since we're talking about car bombs and drinking, angry balls is, uh, what is it? Angry Orchard and Fireball in there. That's an Angry Ball drink. Oh. So that's fun. Fun that's facts brought to you by Elliot. Can, can we drink that instead? We yeah, don't have Fireball. Just as good. Why did I agree to be on this podcast? We're not good at drinking. <laughs> we just smoke weed on this podcast. So. I mean, I'm drinking, but it's not good. Where's my beer? I put it down. Uh, so I guess we'll fast forward because, again, I, I think it's useful to know that this is a very deep-seated, sure. long, uh, mm-hmm. arduous relationship i mean the important thing to note about the henry the eighth thing there's a there's a lot of historical context that there but it's really that ireland is catholic very catholic during this time and what henry the eighth does was invent the church of england which invents protestantism mm-hmm. so they separate from the pope which means that even though ireland is a territory of the british at the moment they tried to enforce protestantism on everybody under the crown and they couldn't do that because Ireland was Catholic. That will come back a million other times um, because the Irish are Catholic. Okay. I don't know what the differences are other than that he made one, I think. Um, I, <laughs> Henry, listen, as Henry, far as I'm concerned, anything that believes in Jesus is the same thing. I don't care what it's called. It's the same thing. It's just the way my brain works. I'm with you on that. I don't understand a lot of organized religion as a person, um, but there do seem to be some very bloody differences. Yeah, yeah I guess other they're people... arguing over the same story yeah. and, who, and who is in the story. Mm-hmm. And Henry VIII decided to put himself in the story and just rewrote the Bible. Um, it's got that big dick energy. And hey, when you Richard have the power, energy. like why not? Yeah, when you're. Would you say? I said big Richard energy. Big Didn't Richie. he have like a father or a son? Somebody's Richard. That's in there. The... Are also many Richards. <laughs> yes. So there's a Richard. I, it was a king joke. All right. <laughs> I don't get many of those. Let's leave that to, to the comedian historians, okay? okay. <laughs> there are like four of us. She gets paid to do this, all right? Paid is a but, relative term. Uh, so I guess that's important to understand. Uh, let's, I guess, fast forward that to sure. more modern history that the collective consciousness would be aware of in Ireland. Um, well, okay, so there was a there was a pretty significant uprising in 1798. It sort of dovetailed with... Um, the American Revolution and the French, you know, every decade revolution. It was pretty instantly quelled by the British, um, bloodily. But but after that, there was just a lot of tension. And, and the British made a lot of concerted efforts to institute some form of racism in a lot of their, their dealings with the Irish. So moving into more recent history, um, I think one of the one of the biggest pieces on the landscape of Anglo-Irish relations happens in the mid 1840s, um, and mostly it's known as the Irish Potato Famine. It is not referred to as the Potato Famine in Ireland. It is usually referred to as the Great Hunger. 
because from their point of view, there wasn't a famine at all. The Irish uh, really lived off of the potato at the, at the time, partially because it has a lot of nutrients and it can sustain, and it's a pretty hardy crop. It saves through the winter. And also, potatoes are great for making clocks. Say clock. Oh. Potato yeah. clocks. Yeah. And like also, bombs. and also, you can make alcohol with them. <laughs> also, so. that. Potato juice. Very good. Vodka. Yeah. It's like a poteen, I believe it. Oh, they also do that. Yeah. yeah. Something else. So the, the problem with the Irish reliance on potato wasn't, the British reframe this often as it being the Irish's fault, but it really was one of the hardier crops that you can grow it really, really quickly. It's only a couple months. It's really cheap um, and it is pretty good for you. So uh, prior to the Great Hunger um, in the early 19th century, they sent over from Britain a couple people just to analyze what was happening in Ireland. And that man remarked that he couldn't believe how healthy these people looked for only living on the potato, which really should have sent up some red flags probably to anyone paying attention, but it didn't because of, again, British colonialism. So the problem was that really driving this this hunger was that the Irish did not own a lot of their own land. After the uprising um, in 1798, the British made a real concerted effort to make sure that the, the Irish didn't have a lot of access to, to pull anything like that off again. So they they really focused their efforts on moving Protestantism over into Ireland and owning all of that land. So there was food in Ireland during the famine. The Irish just didn't have access to it. And due to British oversight and a lot of you know maltreatment and racism, they really didn't even get access to the the food that was being supplied to them in a crisis. And yeah. so and so when you say moving over, was that the British they were uh, colonizing Northern Ireland at this time? That's always been the spot of contention. Um uh, it, it it was all around Ireland. It was it was an attempt to really infiltrate uh Protestantism into all corners of, mm-hmm. of the island. Um and also just to to quell what they believed was voices of dissent. And part of that I think was that the British that moved there had access to that food because it's not like the Irish were just growing potatoes. Right. Uh, they were growing food, sending it places, and they couldn't afford to buy it. Right. And then they had to rely on the potato crops, which they could afford. So they were growing other foods, sending them to these British people, mm-hmm. whether it's back in Britain or people that had come to colonize the island and spread the good word of Protestantism that were able to continue to survive while they were literally living in squalor, right? Correct. So yeah, I I think that might cause some contention. It sure did. I think the thing to really think about uh, with this conversation about the the potato famine really is, historically speaking, like looking back, and you kind of alluded to it already, the the differences between how the Irish view um, this incident and how the British view it. Without getting too far ahead, has has that changed at all? Like historically, I know we still call it the potato famine. Mm-hmm. Um, but is there any even in 2020? I, I'm just thinking like people traditionally identify the end of the Irish Civil War as being in the late 90s. Has that language changed at all? I don't know that the language has changed too much. I do think that there has been a concerted effort on the behalf of Irish historians in particular to assign blame for the famine to the British, um, where it, I think it had been a little, a little nerve wracking before, you know, a lot of Irish historians in the past went to, you know, universities in Britain, not in Ireland. So the language sort of got adopted and co opted into what we accept now as the potato famine. I do think that there's been a lot more effort to say that this was actually just malfeasance, you know, the British wanted them to die. And maybe they didn't actually think i want an irish person to die today because i'm going to go talk in parliament about how poor people deserve it but but i think that's just the reality when you look at it it's either deliberate or it's not but people are dying anyway yeah and um just for context when was the uh, the potato famine uh it is the mid 1840s i think it starts in 42 and ends in 47 i just mid 19th century Mm -hmm. um just for context i'm thinking about like charles dickens sure um it's you know we just had christmas and we watch at least in my house the the muppets christmas carol of course and like any good (laughs) american like that's the only it's the best thing that's come out of this country in 30 years that's how you consume charles dickens now yes exactly (laughs) it's 2021 come on but the reason I'm bringing that up is one of the really um, poignant comments that um, Ebenezer Scrooge makes is that when the 
the poor die, it'll erase the surplus population, sure. which I think is a really important, I guess, psychological understanding of this time period and this understanding. And we've kind of covered it a little bit on this podcast, this idea of what is work and the role of capital to manipulate the labor force to keep cheap labor while also having too much production. Uh, and I think this speaks to it a little bit that mm-hmm. this there was this mentality that rich and upper middle class people felt that there were too many people. And the problem in the country or the world was that there's too many people and we can't feed and supply and clothe them. And it wasn't like something that you said behind closed doors. Right. And I, I think that mentality collectively has some impact on this decision. Again, whether or not it was subconsciously, like you said. Now to bring that kind of back sure. home a little bit. I think primarily about like the Civil War in the United States Mm -hmm. and the fact that we've never made reparations for it, that that psychological mentality of, uh, I guess, uh, conclusion of that uh, of the Civil War that we really haven't had that at this point. And, um, you know, I don't I should probably hand that off to Elliot to talk about more than me. I'm not going to sit here and say reparations need to be made for the Civil War, but I will say I don't think. I don't think the the lesson has even been learned for the Civil War and um, how that still affects the society that we live in today, how we're still fighting the same battle that was fought, even though it ended. We've never actually taken any steps forward to move past it. And there's two different lines of thought right now on the, on extreme ends that are butting heads um, with the perfect example of the BLM protests in the past four years versus the attack on the Capitol about a week, week and a half, two weeks ago. People are seeing those as parallels, and they don't actually understand the difference between the events. They, they do look similar, but you have to understand the history as to what's happening to really see what's going on. And the, like you were saying about the Irish and the British, how the Irish have been, com- I'm sorry, Irish historians have been coming out, correcting the narrative, saying it was malfeasance on the British side and not just bad luck. That's sort of happening in the U.S. now where slavery was bad and we've moved past it, but systemically we really haven't. That's what people are trying to point out. Sure. And I think in terms of public education, there's not a whole lot in either direction. If that makes Americans feel better, you know, there's a whole movement happening in Britain right now that hasn't got probably the traction that it really should, but it's called decolonize the narrative. But it's basically addressing the fact that in British school systems, they don't learn anything about their own history of violence and warfare. Or the other side of their colonialism and imperialism. Right. They only see the British side of it versus what, you know, yeah. those colonies exactly. were like before they showed up and how it affected them after. Right. And it's hard to train and to teach your citizens anything about the world or things that they don't understand about the world when they don't get any of that context. So none of the Irish history is actually taught in British schools. I think the really important point here is that there's this very big historical impact that has happened in both countries that have marginalized a huge population of because uh, what's of Northern Ireland speak uh, speaking of Northern Ireland specifically mm. about what percentage are Protestant versus Catholic? Do you happen to know? Off the top of my head, no. Uh, there are, so there are six counties, but pretty much only Derry has a lot of Catholics. Yeah, London Derry. Yeah, I was going to say, is that Derry or London Derry? Which which one is it? Yes, I, I, yes. I, I, I looked it up and the, I saw the free land of it was interchanging. Derry. So it yeah. depends. Is this like the if you're in British school, it's London Derry, and anywhere else, it's Derry? Well, there's free Derry. It's sort of different. Fist up, free is Derry. That, is that like you are now entering you free Derry? The Baileys and car bombs. This is the you are now entering the autonomous zone of the Zapatistas. Mexican law no longer applies here. All right, say that with a brogue. <laughs> no <laughs> no gotcha yeah <laughs> um so yeah i think um i think that kind of frames up the conversation it's interesting that those things kind of happened at the same time mm. but we're talking both early 20th century yeah or i'm um, sorry mid, uh mid mid 19th yep. century i don't know why i said i followed 20s. you except for the actual yeah you know but they did happen around the same time frame ireland you know i would make the case that the 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 uh, fissures that exist within the, uh, I don't know the difference, but the United Kingdom, let's call it, the British Isles, I, d- I don't know. <laughs> They're all different. I Every time I look at a map, I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then I try to remember it, and I'm like, nope, 
Don't so remember. the United Kingdom is everything except for the Republic of Ireland. The British Isles encompasses the whole thing, but it's not a generally recognized Irish term. Okay, so my point is that yeah, um, fucking viva la revolution <laughs> or, or whatever this. I'm not. I'm not Look, sure. I don't want to start anything new after Brexit. I'm just giving you the facts. <laughs> oh, that's another conversation. Yeah, <laughs> and I, actually, I think a little bit of that plays into some of these the historical narrative that you were just talking about. Sure that a lot of British don't understand the, their history. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only so much time in the day. But I, I mean, now look, I, I don't want to call out the British too severely here. Um, I do. But I, but I do think it's a problem with all places, especially in the West. places? Yeah. Yeah. Let's for go with sure. that. Uh, I think that's... For, so now we've kind of framed up the conversation about what led to the Irish... I, I, I want to say the modern Irish uh, Civil War, because mm -hmm. I think... That that history is old, uh, new enough that it led to specific events that snowballed into mm -hmm. what became the Irish Revolution or Irish Civil War, rather, uh, which we don't really have in this country for a, a number of reasons. But I feel like the things that happened long ago in Ireland are happening now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're just on a later trajectory. So we had the Civil War. And then you had the Reconstruction period, which has its own, like, very complicated history, mm -hmm. where slavery really didn't end in a lot of ways. Things got better for a while, and then things got worse again. But there was never any real moment that was like, I mean, I guess you could look at, like, uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, or you could look <laughs> at Black Wall Street. Uh, those might be examples, I guess, that kind of destroyed any progressive motion for African Americans in the United States, particularly in the South, but I, I don't think those quite relate to the the very political act um, that the Irish took, because those actions were taken by Klansmen primarily. Uh, so that that it's a different relationship in terms of uh, ownership of that action that causes progress or uh, regression. So yeah, like what what were kind of those big first steps sure. uh, that led things forward? Well, I think. First, we're comparing it to the American Civil War because it has it has a lot of ties to that. But think of it more in terms of how the American Revolution was fought. Like this is all guerrilla warfare. It's all sort of low burning hatred of colonization. And, you know, to belabor a point, the things you owe to your colonizer, quote unquote. But it really, you know, the, the tide starts with with the famine and, and how marginalized the Irish actually felt after being starved out of their own lands. Mm -hmm. Fairly. Um, so in Ireland, sort of post famine recovery, they really began to fight for, for home rule. So they wanted a free and independent Ireland. They get it passed in 1912 in the British Parliament with some caveats that they didn't necessarily love. It goes into effect in 1914, and then the world gets embroiled in a world war. Now I'm, I'm going to flex my history muscles. You Go. said in Parliament, was that the Sinn Féin? And am I saying that correctly? You are saying it correctly, Sinn, Sinn Féin. Féin. Yes. That was the parliamentary group. How many people was it? So you're you're a little ahead of us. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. No, no, no. So this is in British Parliament. They enact the Irish Home Rule. Okay. It gets suspended in 1914 because everybody gets fighting a world war. And Britain is like, look, we can't spare you guys. Right. And Ireland was technically neutral. Right. So they suspend Home Rule. And as a result of that suspension, Ireland responds with forming the IRB, so the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which eventually becomes the Irish Republican Army. Okay. So, happy birthday, you guys. Is that really a thing? Their birthday is? No. Oh. I mean, maybe. I IRB, IRA? They got you a car bomb? <laughs> Yay, thank you. I, I told you it was going to be a lot of car bomb jokes. I warned you. Yes, I guess What you side did. of the road did they drive on in Ireland? <laughs> is it left. like the UK? Or are they like super yes. like they just do it on the other side just because it's like fuck you, Britain? I think Free they probably. Yeah. On the right. I think they probably would. <laughs> That's my kind. If of they revolution. had thought about it, that but I think like transitioning chaos. Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, having them drive on the right side and then going into Northern Ireland and Crossing having to switch, border, no. it would just sort of be a big mess. <laughs> Um, Although I do be, I do feel like we should probably suggest this as like, a point. Like it isn't already though. Yeah. So right. so World War Two or World War One happens. Yes. The Irish get fucked. They do. Um. So they start the IRB. They start the IRB, and this is uh, this like when that starts. Is that still the twenties or is this moving forward? 
So that's 1914, 1916. We see the Easter Rebellion. We don't have to get into a lot of that because it lasted for months. It was really, really bloody. Uh, I didn't accomplish it. too much for the Irish, unfortunately. It was, um, it was quelled pretty easily by British troops. And so that was sort of a bummer. It did end in, um, it was mostly just like a voice of like frustration right. that came out in this anger, exactly. right? Yes. So um, like, and the like, IRB was sort of just getting organized. So like BLM. Yeah, yeah. Kind of. What it does do, though, is it forces the British to execute 15 people as they claimed responsibility for, for the uprisings. One of those people, uh, James Conley, was actually pretty severely wounded and then held in a, in a prison, but they wanted to make sure that his, that, you know, he was executed anyway. So made made they strapped of- this man to a chair so that they could shoot him. And let me tell you, that really didn't go great. <laughs> yeah, if you want it a martyr, that's great. a great way to yeah. give yourself a martyr. And that's pretty much exactly what it did. Yeah. And it was tw- 12 people? 15. 15 people. Yeah. And these people were martyred in a sense that yeah. the people were outraged, obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. And it really didn't even sit well in Britain, to be honest. L- little much? Yeah, they were kind of like, that. Probably, I mean, strapping the guy to a chair, like he was literally already dying. So, like, you probably could have just... This wasn't Henry VIII's idea. He's long gone. <laughs> Uh, he's very dead at this okay. point. <laughs> All right. Like young, ter- uh, not Theresa May. <laughs> that would also make sense. But, um, Maggie Thatcher? Yeah. yeah. Uh, young Margaret Thatcher was like at home and like, ooh. That's a good idea. I think I want to do that. Yeah. I want to do more of that. Daddy, yeah. that sounds fun. I-, I don't think she was alive in 1914, but. Okay. So this happened in the 19s, 19, 1910s. 1918. 1918. I was just like kind the of. The 10s. I was trying to like. Yes. Big picture. It was yes. the last time the Red Sox won the World Series before they yes. won again. Yes, 1918. Red Sox win the World Series. Ireland has 15 people assassinated. Starts Sinn Féin. So Ireland got something. Like, Boston's pretty much like Little Ireland. They won a World Series. What are they complaining about? That's true. Ireland, we do have a famine memorial here in Boston. Well, we're not talking about that. <laughs> Fine. We won't talk about it. I have a lot of thoughts on it. You can follow me on Twitter if you want to hear all my thoughts about it. I have a uh, lot of them. So Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin. 1918. 1918. Yes. The, no. This is the parliamentary group uh, that I, the IRB sent to the British Parliament. Sinn Féin is a political party, but they were um, the primary party of the unauthorized by the British Irish Parliament. Unauthorized Parliament. Unauthorized Parliament. Okay. So they were supposed to send a couple people to for representation in the British Parliament, and instead they say, no, sorry, fuck you, we're making our own Parliament, we're free now. So they still want that home rule. They're still- I declare still bankruptcy. Yes. I declare freedom. They were just like, we're done, we're free now. Um, so Eamon de Valera becomes the head of Sinn Féin with Michael Collins, and both of those people come back a bunch of times. Yeah, so let's fast forward. So, I've heard the name Collins before. Um, yes. Who's the other? So Collins brokers the... Sorry, did you want me to... You can talk. I, I, I just, just had figured you didn't I just had a follow-up question. This yeah. is from my personal knowledge. Yeah. I, I recognize the name Collins, but what was, who is the other person? Emma De Valera. De Valera, okay. Yes. And so so they start the Dáil Éireann in, in, um, in 1918. That's the Irish Parliament. Michael Collins becomes the Minister of Finance. Um, both of those people were in prison when they started parliament for treason but then they were like we're not they got broken out basically um car bomb not quite yet wall bomb we're not at car bomb yet okay we do get there but we're, we're not quite there yet so the irb during this time becomes the ira they become the official army of ireland so they're done talking in there they're done talking now yes yeah, and this is when they started getting a really big influx of um like very marxist ideas right yes yes and they start sort of seeking a support from abroad from groups because they really want to be independent so they go to the states um they get they got a lot a lot of popularity over here they go to argentina where there's uh, been significant irish diaspora so from the famine when sort of people were fleeing if they could flee um going back to those roots and saying we really still want to be free they starved us out what are you going to do to help us um, and obviously the French, because the French love a good well, revolution. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna plan a revolution, please involve the French. They Every would like to years. be involved. <laughs> Every ten years. <laughs> like clockwork. You have to love them for it though. Yeah. It's a little healthy rebellion. So they start fighting this guerrilla warfare with the British uh, on Irish soil. Um but now, in now I'm sorry, yeah, one more question. Are we, in? are we in Northern Ireland now? Or is this still We're all still over all over Ireland. Ireland. This is all over Ireland. A lot of these combatants end up happening in Northern Ireland okay, because that's where that seems to be the place of contention because well, that's, that's where all the Protestants were, right? Right. Um, but that this goes back to what we were talking about when they started to colonize. 
Exactly. Okay. Yes. This is so. This is thousands of years we're talking. And if you look on a map with the the islands, you can sort of see. It's easiest to go up through Scotland and just sort of like I think it's like twenty kilometers or twenty miles. I can't remember which one. Probably between Scotland and Northern Ireland. So it's like basically you just get on a little boat. You're there. Okay. It's pretty easy. So in 1921, Michael Collins goes on a trip to visit um, Lloyd George in in Britain. They brokered the Anglo-Irish Treaty. It's basically giving up rights to the six counties in Northern Ireland and saying that Ireland itself, the Republic of Ireland, which is not quite the Republic of Ireland yet, is going to be the Irish Free State. Um, Basically, there's still a commonwealth under Britain, but it's largely ceremonial. You got my air quotes there, I hope. Yeah, Um, you gotta fly a flag. (laughs) Right. They were like, we still own you, but like you could do whatever you want, which is somehow fine. Um, The British love their flags. You gotta fly that Union Jack. Exactly. Um, So pretty much the, the problem with this is no other previously colonized state had agreed to become a commonwealth. Everybody had been pretty much independent at this point. So it's a really shit deal. And so Collins got a lot of shit for it. He actually says when he signed the treaty with Lord George, I just signed my own death warrant, but I thought it was the only choice. Um, and he was right. He was right. Uh, the IRA assassinated him. Car bomb? Yes. Oh, shit. <laughs> Goddamn. Um, so he misstepped. He he settled yes. for too little. And these people were like, that's not that's not enough. Well, he did have some support. It was really the only, in my opinion, um, it was really the only choice on the table. It was as far as they were going to get Britain to cave. It made a lot of sense in the time. You know, Collins was... Literally, like, this is the best deal we're going to get. It will give us the option to fight for a full unified Ireland, which was always the goal of of Sinn Féin and the IRA. Right. Um, So he gets almost all the way there. He's actually the foil to De Valera. Mm -hmm. So Ireland becomes split between these two guys. um, And a lot of current conjecture is that De Valera actually ordered the hit that had him killed. That's not... That's not understood historically as like a true fact with capital letters, but he was pretty pissed. He uh, Collins went without De Valera, like approving what was going to happen. And Collins was just like, yes, we're going to do this. Um, so he really forced De Valera's hand and the IRA wasn't pleased. The IRA has been fighting for a unified Ireland this entire time. And to this day, I believe. Depending who you ask. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, At least until 1998. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, legally speaking, yes. until 1998, and no further. <laughs> Our lawyers are shaking their heads. <laughs> yeah, so we'll we'll fast forward. They got this agreement put together that nobody was happy about. The guy that put it together died in a mysterious car bombing that nobody can point to where it came from. It must have been just a really bad engine or mm-hmm. something. And the next like 20 or so years go by, and things kind of just ratchet up, right? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much everything from 22 to, like, the 70s is kind of just, like, a very low boil of a civil war happening primarily right on that border. Sure. Okay. So just more of the same bullshit on the low simmer. It's the then, 70s that we really see some And as that moisture just boils off, like, you get this really nice viscous liquid that ultimately explodes, right? Um, you got gas on the stove? No, just, like, soup. Soup but doesn't like explode. You, All right. Soup doesn't explode. It doesn't not explode. My, maybe not your soup. It's explosive in flavor. Is that yeah, what you're saying? Yeah, it's explosive and delicious. The secret is time on a car bomb. Yes. Yes. That was well played. Nice. <laughs> traditionally speaking, I guess now we're really getting into what's been traditionally called the Troubles. Right. 1956. Um, is yeah, right, the... right around ni- the 50s. Yep. So you've got about 40 years that this Civil War depending who you ask, mm-hmm. is whether or not it was a, technically a civil war, starts kind of blowing up. Why not? Don't smile at me like that. <laughs> low-hanging fruit. Yes, a little too low-hanging, <laughs> like a car bomb. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's there's a lot of things going on. And um, I think the thing that, and I'll let you talk a little bit about it, and one of the, I think one of the, the, th- the accelerants, to make another car bomb joke, Jesus. <laughs> uh, is that uh, you you brought up this idea of like this very uh, palpable racism that existed, yeah. which intermingled, especially at this period, with a, a bad economy, 
which kind of, again, was that accelerant Mm -hmm. for what became the Irish Civil War, that people couldn't afford anything, they couldn't find jobs or any of these things. And I think that's really important to kind of contextualize the economic conditions that kind of led to that situation where people couldn't afford to live. And then they have this uh, very colonialist relationship with their neighbors. Mm -hmm. So one of the interesting pieces about this is actually looking at at Northern Ireland specifically. So we've already sort of talked about how it's it's primarily Protestant, primarily unionist, which means they are very pro um, being part of Britain, partially because of religion and partially because of convenience, probably now. Um, so one of the interesting parts about Northern Ireland specifically is it it has a really big industry. At a time where Ireland itself, the economy was sort of sluggish and slow and not really competing on a world scale, Northern Ireland is a home of like shipbuilding, especially near uh, near Derry. So there's a lot of work, which is why a lot of the Catholics didn't leave, even if they were pro a free Republic of Ireland, uh, which, by the way, happened in 1949. I forgot to mention that. Even if they were very pro, they didn't tend to leave because there was still a lot of work there. But what was happening in Northern Ireland in this ecosystem is is that the Protestants really owned a lot of a lot of this capital and a lot of this economy. So the Catholics didn't get good jobs. They didn't have access to jobs. They were typically poor and underfed and seeing a lot of uh, problems from just their position in society. So it really starts to boil over for them in the 70s, where they're just sort of done with it. Uh, Bernadette Devlin becomes the big movement behind this. And she does have sort of an American comparison. Um, She is a little like AOC. I thought that would make you happy. Why would that make me happy? We love AOC. Am I Ben Shapiro? Okay. Ooh. <laughs> okay. It was a joke. It was a oh, joke, guys. Do me, do me next. I who am I? Short, who am I? <laughs> you want to be Herman Cain? Uh, <laughs> I'm glad uh, I got that sound on. <laughs> let's move on now. I need another beer. <laughs> Wait, who does that make me? What? Who does that make me? Uh, get her. <laughs> Give me a second. Hold on. Okay, good. Let's hurt my feelings. I'm gonna make it really good. Oh god. I'm not because I can't think of anybody for some reason. <laughs> um, that just means I'm very original. Yeah, let's go with that. Uh, Nash Flynn, everybody. <laughs> Nash Flynn, call your state representative and tell them they're being replaced with Nash Flynn. <laughs> There's no one like her. I will run everywhere because of be car bad at it. <laughs> because of car <carbons. laughs> That, don't that trust, literally don't trust sense. nobody. <laughs> well, you said you would run everywhere because you don't want to get in a car because it's going to blow up. So it does make sense. I just keep thinking I thought about you were the comedian that time here. we watched Casino. It, the, oh. the beginning of the movie is literally Robert De Niro blowing up in a car bomb. Yes. I don't know how many times we've seen that scene. Yeah. Is that because they switch him with a dummy and you can see it? Yes. It was very poor editing. <laughs> yes. Oh, the 80s. They were great times. Uh, anyways... To get back to, I guess, the reason we're yeah, hanging we're out. Leave off. So you've got this fuel for the fire sure. going on in mm-hmm. the early stages of the Civil War. And you've got this weird coalition that's fighting for civil rights because the economy is just decimating these people who can't yeah. afford to live. And the, the little bit of industry that exists in Northern Ireland is primarily going to the Protestants mm-hmm. because they already own all of the capital. Right. And they're taking care of each other. Yeah. Um, so what ends up happening in this community, in the Catholic community primarily, is that there becomes this very interesting progressive coalition of people that want to be um, equal. People, again, we talked a little bit about the IRA, and for a lot of people in Ireland, the IRA was a little bit too militant. They didn't feel comfortable with the fact that they were so brazenly accepting of war or guerrilla warfare, whatever you want to call it. But so where they pass the point of let's say uh, diplomacy depends who you ask. Uh, but as the Civil War started, I think they were kind of teetering on the edge. And even if you weren't against it, or if you were against it, you weren't like vocally or aggressively against it. It was kind of like we have different methodologies, but we're, our end goal is the same, and that's more important right now. And I'll I'll kind of hand that off to you in a minute. I'm just kind of framing it up, I guess. But what ended up happening, and I think is really poignant for what's happening right now in the United States, is that the fact that this coalition began to exist, which is obviously good for these people that they're like kind of finding this solidarity, 
is that that became really easy fodder for the other side of, oh, they're siding with the, you know, the radicals with the guns and things like that. And I think this goes back to like, especially here, you'd mentioned like, oh, that's like their Black Lives Matter, like this, like, massive, massive anger that kind of lashed out at a system that wasn't listening. Currently, what's happening, if you watch like mainstream news, uh, is this like, very uh depending where you watch if you're watching fox it's obviously a little bit more aggressive about it but like this very latent understanding of this militant side of black lives matter and using that as a justification for continuing the system that exists saying that like oh if these militants do something if they kill somebody or if they you know are aggressive like you think about what happened in i think it was seattle where uh, that man shot another guy because he felt his life was on or his friend's life was uh, being threatened. And uh, there was a retaliatory murder by the cops where like they it's pretty much been publicly accepted. It wasn't even they had no intention of arresting him. They went there to kill him. That was accepted by the public for the most part because of the fact that what that first guy had done was considered to be a, a heinous act despite the fact that it was self-defense because of his affiliation with Black Lives Matter and the supposed left-wing Marxist piece of the coalition that makes up Black Lives Matter. You see this happening in Ireland in the 50s uh, with the Marxist involvement with the IRA. So I, I think that's a really important component when we start talking about the civil rights movement that's going on in, in Ireland at the time. So I guess to kick it back to you... How did the 50s and 60s and this weird coalition and their relationship to the Protestants kind of play out? So we see in the 70s this uptick of like very, very violent clashes. Um, starts with the Battle of the Bogside in Northern Ireland, which is um, sort of this, this start of this Ulster volunteer force. So you start to see the Unionists mobilize, really fight back alongside uh, the British forces. For a while, they play happily together against uh, against the IRA um, and the Catholics. So you see the Battle of Bogside, which is really su when some people say the troubles really began. Obviously, it, it stems a little bit before that. There are some precursing events, but um, but it really is cited as sort of it really derailing in, in 72, I believe. And then, and then obviously, Bloody Sunday, which everybody is somewhat familiar with. Sunday, Bloody Sunday. No, you too. Oh, we don't. We don't, we don't do that too. on this podcast. No, you alone. Instead of you two, come on. Nothing. I got dad jokes. I'm let's, a dad. Let's leave it to Nash Flynn. <laughs> it's maybe not. It's been really Listen, it, it's actually really, really hard to be a comedian and a historian because you don't get an opportunity to really make a ton of jokes that are both things. Um, yeah, I've been I doing would, a lot just, of car bomb jokes. I would just, I I would just defend about. a ton of Irish people if I made any jokes, so I'm staying quiet over here. I, I mean, I, I think the only joke I really have on this is... Um, Calm like a bomb? It's not that one. Please don't think that I gave him that one. It's really that, the, you know, over <laughs> decades... He's laughing. He's it's not. So he's bad. just being polite. It's so good. So bad. <laughs> See? Come on. Raging Machine is allowed on this podcast. Yes, Go ahead now. A hundred percent. It's just that, you know, this this is a really, really bloody affair. It's it's really it's it is a guerrilla war, so it, lots of people die. Some of them die really violently. Um there's a lot of Sure, and these are it's a civil war, so these are neighbors and people right. you know, this is in their neighborhood on their turf. Um it's not something they see on the news every day. It's right. in their neighborhoods and backyards and, and you know, it starts in the 50s and ends in 1998. Sure. Um, so four ends, decades. You know, ends. And, and it's very, very Irish Catholic of them to refer to this entire situation as the Troubles. The Troubles. Like you're having an unwanted pregnancy at 16. The Troubles. For, for a four year. You said uh, you weren't going to make that joke. I oh. said I wasn't going to make it, but I, I did make That's it. That's awesome. So there you we are. swung for the fucking bleachers. <laughs> I feel like you're going to edit this out. <laughs> no. I'll give you that one. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate you giving it to me because I don't get to tell my famine memorial joke. Yes. <laughs> I'm 50%. It counts. So she's half offended. I'm something. half offended. Um, and the other half is British. So. <laughs> oh, wow. So, <laughs> so that part hates the other side? More within yourself. Yeah. If you have a stroke, which side won? I'm just curious. The car bomb. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best I could do. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> um, she stole your joke. She did, but she didn't even do it good. No, like, I didn't. I didn't. If you're going to... I don't know how to make a good car bomb joke, I guess. <laughs> Clear, it's yo. all about timing yeah <laughs> <laughs> see he's got it so anyways 
I guess so. You've you kind of covered a lot of the things I wanted to cover. Sure. And I want to go to um, the town of Derry, the free town of Derry, London which will Derry. never be recognized in this podcast as London Derry. London for the record, the free town of London um, Derry. where all of these things came to head. Right. Sure. So Derry uh, was a Catholic stronghold, and the Protestants decided to bring a parade through the town. They did. And much like the recent insurrection in D.C., all it really took was uh, a handful of people that made, I don't even want to say poor decisions, but that made a decision that could snowball into something far more significant, where, you know, we just saw this protest or this insurrection and everyone jokes about it and whatever. What concerns me the most is that they had an intent and you don't have to be smart to have a good shot. You don't have to be smart to hit the wrong person at the wrong moment. Like, and I think that's what concerns me the most, uh, is the left laughing about what happened, being like, what a bunch of fucking morons that thought they could do this and like were so poorly prepared because of the fact that they had so much insider help that it really, all it would have taken is if that woman hadn't been shot off of the woman that died, she was climbing into the, or trying to climb into the window where the Senate was. All she had to do was get over that window and take one shot and this country would have been in fucking civil war. Like, I don't think people have really made that connection that, like, she was probably 10 feet away from a civil war in this country. And it has nothing to do with her having a great plan or her really even understanding what she was doing uh, to her fullest capacity, but being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I think we see that play out in Derry. So I'll I'll let you talk about it if you want to. I mean, I, I think I think some people made some poor decisions. I think the I, British probably made I, some poor decisions. Again, like the the point is that isn't that like everything's going to play out the same exact way? But you have this parade that decides to go through Derry, and that was a poor decision to allow in the first place. Mm-hmm. Much like it was a poor decision to allow Donald Trump to have a protest rally outside of the fucking Senate when they're counting the votes against him. Like, who thought that was going to go okay? All it took was really a couple of protesters to start throwing rocks and the police who have been tired of dealing with this, whatever they were calling it at the time, because I don't think it, they were calling it the troubles, but maybe whatever, isolated incidences, mm-hmm. um, and feeling frustrated and kind of taking it out on those protesters. And it kind of snowballed yeah. uh, into a multi-day affair. Yeah. And um, they went from guns to weapons. And uh, what? Well, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, from rocks to weapons. Yeah. I mean, also guns. Yeah, I mean, they might have been throwing guns and then shooting guns. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not Irish. I'm Italian. Like we don't. I mean, when you run out of bullets, we just go straight to guns. We don't fuck around. When you uh, run out of bullets with your gun, you just throw the gun. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Just a heavy club, yeah. <laughs> right. It's yeah. just a rock that has. They used to have bullets in it. It's a very weirdly shaped rock. It's easy to throw though, like a javelin. <laughs> Okay. I've never so. thrown a. I've never thrown you're a gun. You've never thrown a gun. I've never been near a gun. <laughs> I think that's important to clarify. Yeah, uh, what's interesting is the protests started blowing up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Getting laughs. I am laughing. Yes. It's a silent laugh. Yes. It hurts. I tried not to, but... <laughs> yeah. And they ended up bringing the British Army to try to maintain as a neutral force. Yes. Which I think the fact that both sides it had initially genuinely considered the British Army a neutral force is really interesting, first off. Because of the fact that the British are the reason this clusterfuck is happening. Right. And despite that, they don't look at them as the primary agents of the conditions and instead really direct their anger towards the Protestants themselves, which I think is important to kind of keep in mind. As a neutral force, they they feared that the nationalists, those that supported the British, the Protestants, would not exist to maintain law and order, but to crack down on the Irish nationalists. Mm-hmm. So the protesters continued escalating, and fears from the loyal Irish that the nationalists would win led to three different groups infighting, essentially. The Irish nationalists being the enemy of both sides, the Protestants being concerned that the British were going to be too nice to the Irish or the Catholics, and then the British army just trying to maintain the peace, but also kind of hating the nationalists. So you've got these three different parties kind of playing out, even though two are kind of on the same side, Mm -hmm. they're having a hard time seeing eye to eye. And again, I think this is really important to consider, again, thinking about the insurrection. Like you have a party of people that were trying to overthrow the government to maintain the government, which seems kind of ludicrous 
but it it speaks to a very similar condition. I mean, I think it describes it perfectly for what it was. It was a protest and an insurrection, so we'll just call it a protest direction. That that sounds like something's wrong with your dick. <laughs> right? I'm really not doing my job here. Right? But I'm not. Why touching. did I bring you on here? As a <laughs> You're not touching that one. I'm not I, touching that. That was a toss up. In fairness it hit to me, the ground like a hood of a 1968. I don't know what they drive in Ireland. <laughs> BMW. Toyota Corolla. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but like, even like you look at like Portland or Seattle or Minneapolis, and you've got the Proud Boys facing off against uh, Black Lives Matter protesters or Antifa, and then you've got the local cops getting involved, and you've got this triangulated relationship where two of them are kind of on the same side, but they can't officially be on the same side. At the same time, there's factions of like the three percenters or the Patriot Prayer or whoever, who also hate cops. The system isn't exactly what they want. So you've got this weird challenging of authority while also being on the same side, but you also have a common enemy. Right. That just that triangulated relationship gets really messy. I guess that's why this is this whole clusterfuck is considered a, a low grade civil war because it's a three way fight. This is what I was asking earlier. It doesn't really seem like there's a place for diplomacy or really talking about it because everybody is fighting somebody from all of the deep seated, you know, history and, and everything that's happened with the violence. And, um, yeah, what it, what it comes down to is the fact that nobody can get a majority. If there's 30%, 30%, 30%, right. or if one goes up to 40, right. whatever, you're never going to have one part, one side that has a majority, and they're going to continuously be fighting. Right, we definitely see that now, currently, in the United States. It's troubling. Oh, there we go. Yeah. That's that car bomb time. In the <laughs> Only took an hour to get there, but boom. you got a joke in. <laughs> Nash just went boom. Let's go. Listen, in fairness to me, I'm I'm actually a death waste historian and an American colonialist. So you goddamn colonists. <laughs> That's colonialist. true. I mean, yes, <laughs> correct. That's the British side of you. <laughs> Emphasis yeah. on the death part and not necessarily the colonialist part. Not the ways because you don't go anywhere. Because <laughs> do we want to talk about Maggie Thatcher? Uh, no. Oh. I mean, I, we can talk about how she's dead, but. I mean, I don't really want to talk about it. I figured you did. But we could talk about um, in 79. So we've had low-grade escalations be in the 70s. Um, I say Well, low actually, before we get there, yeah. uh, I do want to say a couple sure. of things. Sure, go. So uh, ultimately, the protests did eventually just kind of fizzle out, and there were small skirmishes that took place in random places. And we really won't get into that. Uh, the point is that there was a lot of tit-for-tat going on, mm -hmm. uh, where one side would attack the other side, and the other side would respond back with their own uh essentially assassination revenge killings uh, yeah revenge yeah. killings very um, reactionary no nothing moving forward mm -hmm. in the conversation at all yeah, just, yeah. Um, a bunch of violence yeah so and it's not just like the two sides went against each other that are like paramilitary but they also the ira went explicitly after the the military itself the british military yeah. um so they were fighting two wars while each side was fighting kind of one war and not working together but not really against each other except there were i think a, a handful of occasional instances what ended up happening is you've got this war that's just or this whatever low-grade civil war this constant series of terrorist attacks is what we'd probably call them in 2021 and it just burnt out the british army because they were just they were tired of the slow progress and they started doing a lot of what would be considered war crimes today. They were essentially grabbing mil uh, militia leaders off the street. They were torturing them and they were murdering them. And those those people became martyrs and kind of galvanized that support instead of like causing things to, for people to be burnt out and tired of it and just accepting things. Instead, they're like, oh, fuck you. You're not getting away with that. So there, the military's exhaustion from this long term at this point, multi-decades, uh, low-grade civil war, instead of it kind of fizzling out, it was getting bigger because of their frustrations and exhaustion. And this led to a lot of things that created uh, a more colonized experience for the Irish people. Things like checkpoints became very po uh, common. Military policing and their handling of dealing with riots uh, became much more aggressive. And again, I, w I think this is really important for us to think about in the Black Lives Matter era in 2020, mm -hmm. um, how many of these things we're so used to seeing now. We have the, the inauguration coming up, and they said there's more U.S. soldiers in the Capitol 
than in, I think, Syria. And I think that's considering the condition of Syria right now, which we just covered in the last episode. That is fucking frightening. So I, I think we're starting to see the early stages of a lot of those conditions where police are burnt out. I know on the news, like with the insurrection, a lot of things they kept talking about is these cops are so tired from the protests all summer. So we're already kind of hitting that point where the cops are burnt out and pissed off that, you know, there's this galvanized group against them. I thought they'd be happy about job security. You would think, but apparently these guys don't want to work. Ungrateful swine. Right? Right. I think they do have pretty solid job security regardless. I mean, I'll give, them more, I'll give them work. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> so we see these conditions kind of building up despite the fact that it might seem like at some point they would start to fizzle out. This kind of boiled over in 1972 during an anti-internment march when the British soldiers, they were uh, burnt out and there's a, a really rowdy crowd. They ended up firing in, and not that that's any excuse at all for their actions. I'm um, just trying to contextualize it, I guess, and try to be objective. They ended up killing 14 people, shooting out, uh, shooting into the crowd. This became known as Bloody Sunday. So the Irish obviously didn't take that like lying down and the IRA quickly detonated 22 car bombings uh, over the remainder of that year, killing nine. Things began to escalate really quickly. There were already these checkpoint areas, but no-go areas broke out, uh, which relied primarily on paramilitaries and barricades. And it ultimately took 27,000 British soldiers to clear this out. The, eventually, the British army was like, we can't keep letting this happen. We need to like just go in and clean house. They sent in 27,000 British soldiers to clear this out. It's now, ground. Yeah. So what I think is really interesting about this is I want to bring this back to the United States in terms of kind of what that data means. So for context, at this time, there's about 1.5 million people in Northern Ireland, which is where these no-go areas were. They weren't in, in the Republic of Ireland, just in Northern Ireland. That's roughly one British soldier per every 56 Irish citizens. Now, in America, there's about 331 million people in 2020, meaning that if the same conditions existed here to clear out those same kind of no-go areas and those barriers and things like that, it would take roughly 5.9 million soldiers to remove those no-go areas and to de-escalate things. To make a point, that's four times larger than the entire active duty personnel of the United States. So like, there's no fucking way, especially considering the United States is the primary source of soldiers for like NATO to ever clear this out. If this were to happen here, it, the scale might not ex get to that extent mm -hmm. of what happened in Ireland. Sure. I think it's really important to kind of contextualize this in terms of what that scope really looks like when we're talking about the United States. Like we were like, Oh, if, I, I don't know the number, but like say off the top of my head, there's like 200 no go zones in Ireland. You're like, all right, that's like a decent amount, but it's like 200. But because of the population difference, that would be like 60,000 in the United States or whatever that number might be. Sure. And yeah. I think that's a main point to make when we were talking about drawing the parallels from this lesson in history to what we're currently seeing today. If there was a low grade civil war here, potentially, if that's the number that it would take to quell it, that's something that, you know, should give you pause and something to think about. Yeah. And Obviously, we're skimming through this stuff really quickly, but... We've been at it for an hour, damn it. We're talking about 40 years in an hour, or depending on if you're talking like about... a thousand years. Yeah, <laughs> a thousand years, depending who you ask. Broad strokes. A very broad strokes. We've got work here to do at the Poor Pearl's Almanac. Yeah, but, you know, there's a really interesting triangulated relationship that existed in Ireland that obviously exists here. And I, I think it's important to think about the fact that any challenge to state power, whether it's right wing or left wing, is going to get stomped out, which is why a lot of people expected like when the insurrection happened, these people weren't going to get arrested. But the fact is that they challenged the state power and they're they're going to fucking slam their foot on them because like it's one thing to protest. It's another thing to actually physically try to challenge that power. And um, in the left in the United States, particularly, the left has been building up to try to really not create a militia per se, but like create an organized movement towards building solidarity and understanding of weaponry. So you have groups like the Socialist Rifle Association and the Anarchist Rifle Association that are organizing to teach particularly uh, marginalized people 
how to shoot weapons, how to uh, the process of getting ownership of them, and uh, giving them safe places where they can learn to shoot if they don't feel comfortable going to the traditional ranges, which I get. And we, we talked about it a bit in the prologues about the experience of going to a range and um, what, what goes with that, depending on your background. That said, you know, we, we kind of brought up this idea that all it takes is one bad instance to create civil war conditions in the right you know situation like the insurrection or a series of small yeah i won't say small but a series of instances uh usually in quick succession we're looking at like we said a four decade plus timeline in in the under a microscope but when we frame it up in the conversation we're looking back well we go back the past four years and we can see a lot of similarities drawn to our current situation yeah uh, from these four decades yeah the, the reason why I think these things are important and why it's important to kind of compare them is if we look at some place like Charlottesville, Dr. Cornell West had made the case that if it weren't for the groups like Redneck Revolt, which doesn't exist anymore, who showed up and were armed and ready to defend them, the church they were in was surrounded by white supremacists who were there to burn it down. And if it weren't for the armed militia that it existed, he probably wouldn't be alive and he's very much like a a far left uh, liberal. Like he's not really like a Marxist or a communist or an anarchist or anything. I don't get the impression he has any interest in guns. But he recognized the fact that if it weren't for these people who did believe in guns, he probably would be dead. And I think that's important to reinforce that all it takes is for them to not exist to be that pushback, which we saw a bit in D.C. at the insurrection is that Antifa, Black Lives Matter weren't there, and look how quickly it escalated. Mostly because they know better than to show up at the Capitol because, like, they don't fuck around. Unless you're white, apparently. I mean, if I didn't have a job right now, I'd think about doing something to go to federal prison. <laughs> think it should be somewhere warm. Three hots in a cot, baby. Yeah. So yeah, I guess let's let's accelerate from there. Let's get into the 80s. For starters, in, in the 70s, to take us back just slightly, mm-hmm. so the IRA are really employing this, like, revenge killing, and then there's, like, a response from either the British or the Northern Irish. In the 70s, the IRA successfully murder, kill, assassinate, whatever word you want. Uh, car bombinate. Well, this wasn't a car bomb. This was a oh. boat bomb. <laughs> a boat bomb. Is that, like, a, a super bomb. car bomb? It's a naval car bomb. Oh, I'm going to have to think about that. I'm going to have mm. to come up with something good for that. How many knots in that potato? Because, like, naval. Got it. Knots. <laughs> All right. So they, they kill <laughs> Lord... I, I shook my head. I, it was a thinker. So they, they kill uh, Lord Mountbatten, who is uh, a royal family member, and his two grandchildren, while they're out on a boat, they had a family vacation home in Ireland. Um, so they get murdered, um, and obviously Maggie Thatcher doesn't take that one lying down. I mean, she probably did, I guess. It was probably in the middle of the night for her, but... (laughs) Sorry, that was an image no one wanted. (laughs) Picture her in the, like, the jammies with, like, the nightcap. And, like, the candelabra getting up. Oh, sorry. She wasn't in office yet. That was a lie. She was in politics, but she was not. Well, then. Yes. Way to fucking go. Sorry. Quote, unquote, historian. (laughs) Um, So that was one of the first times they really felt it on the mainland. In terms of, of... The violence. Yes. The, yeah. Yes. Thank yep. you. And then Maggie Thatcher enters office in 1979. So welcome to the 80s. We made it. Maggie. Bad hair. Um, at the time, they were dealing with a lot of... Well, she herself was dealing with a lot of hunger strikes happening in the prisons for Irish freedom. But she was not super pleased about that. What a shock. She was annoyed that the peasants required things. Yes. Yes. So she became the IRA's primary target pretty quickly into her, into her tenure as prime minister. They did make an assassination attempt in uh, 1984 where they, uh, with, they took out the hotel she was staying in. It took out her bathroom, but unfortunately she survived. Um, I said the word unfortunately and I didn't mean to. (laughs) No, you Tell us how you really feel. (laughs) I'm really sorry about that. Please edit it out. No. (laughs) Oh, they're coming for you. MI6 is fucking on this shit. The Thatcher Snatcher is coming for you. Nice. (laughs) So, so she lives um, and she's pretty pissed about it. So she goes. she's alive. (laughs) 
Sorry, no. She's pissed about <laughs> almost being murdered. She's very happy to be alive. She likes power a lot. She hasn't been doing it very long. She's like thrilled. Must have been a nice ass bathroom. She was pissed. A lot she was of, a lot of furious. She was like, I had plans had a French to take a nice tub, and now it's exploded, and some people are dead. Um, so the day after the bombing of the hotel, um, the IRA claims responsibility, and Maggie Thatcher is like, absolutely, that's enough. That's enough. She said that those responsible were going to pay. And this is really when the tide starts turning for the IRA somehow. People are sort of tired of this constant fear of car bombs and this this just like violence. Um, right. It doesn't seem like, uh, well, to me, just looking back on it, and I'm still lear- I'm learning about this sure. whole thing right now. But it doesn't really seem like they're asking for much at this point. It just sort of right. seems like they're venting frustration over and over again. They're spinning their wheels, right. really. Is yeah. they're, not, they're asking for something they know they're never going to get. Right. right. And they're not going to get it because Northern Ireland exists. Right. And that's really not... So, so what IRA really wants at this point is a unified free Ireland. Mm-hmm. They're not going to get it because Northern Ireland does not want to be right. They part want of... the whole island. Right. They want the right to self-govern and to choose what that governing feels like. So we'll talk about this a little bit later. Okay. Um, Probably not too much later because like maybe a minute. Go ahead, finish your point. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. No, no, no. So there's there's an Anglo-Irish agreement in, I think, 85 that starts this like slow roll into these peace talks that go into the 90s. But really, we start to see some tactics to to dissuade the IRA um, or dissuade free people from supporting the IRA, basically being like, they're a bunch of thugs, for lack of a better term. Um, and you really start to see this tide turning for them, where they were a big, big, big force for this Irish movement, and they start to lose steam a little, and they sort of disintegrate and get involved um, more politically later on as parts of Sinn Féin come sort of back to the table. Okay, so would you say um, within the IRA... At this time, uh, was there any sort of like power vacuum with you know small groups of support trying to take the movement in a progressive direction, trying to move forward, or was everybody just fixated on revenge, like revenge all the time? I mean, I'm not sure that anybody really knows what the IRA narrative really looked like internally, mm-hmm. unless they were a member. Um, but there definitely does seem to be some kind of fracturing. The group does take responsibility for, for a lot of the violence on the landscape, so there is at least some notion that that there is some organization, um, but I can't speak to that specifically either in either direction. I don't know if you yeah. think. No, I can't, but I think the important thing to keep in mind is I don't think without assassination attempt, Thatcher would have come to the table right. to discuss and at least give the... Well, here's the thing is they already had like the bullshit paper... Like, we're going to pretend to care. Like, she had to feign enough interest that gave them a sense of self-determination that they were looking for. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just enough, I think, that it merited challenging the IRA's ability to do what they felt was necessary. Right. Because she had given enough, just enough, that it became a question of, well, we've gotten something we haven't for so long. What's the point of continuing to do these very violent and again it was more of a means to an end that mm. became less justified once the new peace treaty started rolling in right as time went on the actions of the ira didn't no longer they were no longer beneficial for their politics in terms of the the way they were perceived by their community and this kind of opened up the opportunity for some to kind of find that middle ground to get into the politics and dismiss the the violent component of the IRA right. and find a way to make a voice for the Irish free state without using bombs. You know, there's obviously two different perspectives on whether or not that was successful because the Civil War has ended, and that's a good thing, I guess. And I'm Still using those air quotes. Yeah, well, you know, there, there hasn't been an, an attack by the IRA or a coordinated bombing in 20 two years 23 years Mm -hmm. however you could say that ireland still doesn't have a free state so the politics hasn't worked either right so that and that's what makes the relationship so tenuous is that right now things are just kind of in a no man's land yeah and i think um the main takeaway from this last point we're making is the body count is significantly 
high at this point, Mm -hmm. and people didn't really expect an answer, but they got an answer that helped them move forward. Right. And it was sort of like, we've been fighting so long, what was the question we asked? And then they got the answer, and now there's sort of like a lull in order to you know, think and contemplate, all right, what now what do we want now? How do we move this forward from here? Right. Yeah. So I think the first thing I want to talk about before we kind of talk into like, I guess, the the wrap up of yep. this and how it plays out in terms of the United States is to kind of look at these stats that exist. And again, uh, translate those stats into what it would look like if that same per capita figure played out in the United States. Again, high body count. Yeah. So over the course of about 30 to 40 years, depending on when you want to start that date, there were about 3,500 deaths from the Irish Civil War. Quick stat that I read, around 60% of that was civilians, 18% was paramilitary, and then the other was uh, loyalists. I think they were at a, in the 20s. Yeah. So, so uh, like a lot of non-combatants and people who weren't even involved in this mm-hmm. conflict, a high majority of them... Um, we're, we're killed because of it. So still, still a civil war. We, we've said low grade, but that's still pretty terrible. Yeah. We're going to talk about why low grade is not as low as you think. So again, we talked about when we were talking about like the no goes areas, how much larger that 27,000 British soldier population was once you adjusted it for the uh, population of the United States. Uh, that kind of plays out here too. So. Again, Northern Ireland in 1998 had about 1.7 million people. So we're going to use that higher number just to kind of lowball the per capita death rate for the United States, because obviously in the 70s, there were probably less people living there. So for 1998, there was about one in every 486 people were killed by the Civil War. An American equivalent would be around 681,000 deaths from a similar low-grade war. And again, to point to Elliot's point, um, about what was it, you say 60 percent yeah about 60 percent were civilians so that's like four hundred thousand civilians dying from violence that they were had no part of um maybe strong opinions on facebook but yeah really no part in the fight <laughs> yeah i, I really want to like that number when i read it i was like holy shit that's fucking high so i ended up doing the math a couple times just to confirm because i was just like that seems so crazy high so for context All American wars since the revolution through Desert Storm was around 651,000 deaths. That includes the Civil War. So if you were to take the Irish Civil War and compare it to the United States population, we have lost less people per capita in every war the United States has been in than Ireland lost in what's considered a low-grade Civil War. And I don't think that can really be understated. And I actually want to make a deathways point about that. Um, so, so death is more of my historical area, which you know is a really fun topic for a comedian. But the American Civil War actually changed our entire relationship with death because we felt like there were so many bodies and so many people knew people who had died and seen it. Like the battlefields were were everywhere on our landscape. So I think making your point a little stronger, it is insane that their death ways relatively went unchanged over this period. Yeah. Right. We've gone back to saying, you know, it had been a thousand years. Well, so sure. the grass is pretty green over there because maybe they're all Marines because it well, I mean, we're from blood, blood, blood. We're only talking about a 40 year span, if I understood that point correctly. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. For Right. But we're still talking about, well, at the beginning, we were talking about the whole history and how right. these emotions and, and all of these things run very deep. That That's a whole lot of... A whole lot of death. Yeah. Yes. I want to bring up this point to kind of tie back into this idea of the per capita. So we, we've been talking about this idea of car bombs. And when, again, if this were to take place in the United States, that per capita car bomb rate would be much, uh, or the rate wouldn't change, but the amount, the volume in the United States would be significantly higher if something like this were to break out. Now, when the IRA were planning these attacks, Mm -hmm. did they ever do anything that would attack like infrastructure, food systems, power systems, transportation systems, anything like that? As far as I know, and again, this is not really my area, but... But it wasn't like a... Or my point is like, is that at some point a primary point of like, all right, if we're going to starve them out or we're going to, you know, whatever. There was never any very big deliberate attempt to cripple a people because i think part of it too is that that the ira really tried to choose political opportunities 
or do a revenge killing based on those political opportunities that were already sort of done against them. So, you know, I think they really did try to make a concerted effort to only involve the people for whom they sought responsibility. Um, you know, they they did blow up a hotel that, that they knew Maggie Thatcher was in, so it probably did kill some civilians, but there was no attempt to to cut off British supply at any stage or to, to murder civilians solely for the benefit of murdering civilians. This went from a revolution to like a personal beef. Like, it sounds like some gang shit. I mean, in the 80s, in the 80s, there's really an attempt to discredit what's what's happening because so much of it had become a stalemate at that point in Northern Ireland specifically. And, and so you see the party leader of Sinn Féin, who's sort of the majority at the moment, Jerry Adams, uh, in 88 actually starts to distance himself, whereas this, the Sinn Féin and the IRA had really had a collaborative relationship for a lot of years prior to that. And he really starts to be like, you guys need to stop. So um, one of the one of the precursor events for that is two British troops actually accidentally, so the story goes, wander into an Irish funerary procession. Um, and they get murdered by the IRA. Um, and their naked bodies are left out. It makes the news. It's it's sort of on the tail of the Maggie Thatcher assassination attempt. And that's really where you start to see Sinn Féin be like, look, we are not we are no longer condoning the IRA and you start to see the support for them really taper off after that, where they sort of take the background and Sinn Féin becomes a negotiating party with the British and with Northern Ireland representatives. So we'll wait to see that parallel happen in the United States. <sighs> peace talks, man. Yeah. If we're lucky, we'll have peace talks someday. <laughs> well, apparently you need peace walls and we're getting pretty good building those. So Are we? I feel like maybe we I are. Mean, yeah, we're trying. <laughs> we're in the early stages. <laughs> I think there's another similarity that I want to point out that we really didn't cover, mm-hmm. uh, but I think it's really important, especially in the United States and the way, you know, you watch like, I think about when you watch the election and like they are, they start like calculating the vote and you watch where the votes are and things like that. Within Ireland, we have this obvious border of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. But more clearly, we also see these divisions between urban and rural, um, where the urban spaces are primarily driven by industry which is owned by capital which is owned by protestants and the urban the rural space is kind of where the cultural identity of ireland has continued to exist and i know we didn't even talk about the language component of ireland because we're not really here to just talk about ireland but i know you have a background in that so i don't know if you want to talk about that at all i mean so so the irish language it, it it does still exist. People often refer to it as a dead language. That is very inaccurate. Uh, last year, I think they the, the number of people that were relatively fluent was like 1.5 million, uh, which is way higher than I thought it would be. But it, it does exist in pockets of Ireland. Some of them are rural. It's really not spoken to the cities. But it is um, it is there. It is an official language in Ireland. Um, and you are required to learn it to pass your leaving cert, which is the Irish version of the diploma. The reason I bring that up is because the language language is so cultural. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're talking about a very cultural, like, the reason why there's Catholics is because they right. said, fuck you, to Protestantism. Right. Yeah. The fact that there's these pockets, uh, these urban pockets mm-hmm. that have primarily drawn that Protestant culture and kind of uh, nullified their historical culture, and then these rural spaces that have kind of refused that, are those the pockets of catholics within northern ireland i mean i'm not so sure how it how it breaks out on the the physical landscape i I am curious to see post brexit the official post brexit what what northern ireland decides to do because they were pretty much unilaterally in favor of remaining in the eu so obviously when brexit triggered it didn't represent their views but throughout ireland i do think that there is a hope of a unified united ireland at some point i hope they get it because i think at this point they've they've been fighting each other for so long i think it would be nice yeah i mean you'd them. think after all the car bombings right. you'd think you'd want somebody new and like right. i i, I just a car bomb with <laughs> right i mean i don't know i don't know how predominantly the the religious factor is still playing in I mean, I'm not. I'm sort of a religious, so I guess it's hard for me to. Yeah, I think though, and I think this gets lost in the United States because of a lot of things. The the cultural right. aspects of religion. You know, my family's from Italy, and 
like they're not religious, but they're still religious because it's part of their cultural identity and it has nothing to do with like what they believe or anything like that. Um, it, you know, my, my father is an atheist and he also yelled at me for not baptizing my kids because that's what you do. Uh, even though he, he agrees that it's pointless, it, it's the cultural marker mm. that's more important than the, the spiritual component. And I think that still exists more heavily in Europe than it does here in the United States. Yeah. Well, to make a point, we were talking about the histories and those histories are tradition. So yeah, the, the difference in sex, the difference in um, religion, the difference of being a loyalist or a Republican, those are traditions in and of themselves, right? Yeah. Like um, when you grow up in that and with that, wouldn't you already at, have at your this opinion point, formed? Like, yeah. Like when you're talking about 40 years of war, like, yeah, your position's pretty immalleable. So to kind of circle this back, I guess, you know, when we're talking about the United States in particular, we try to imagine what it, it's funny, like a lot of the notes I wrote were before the insurrection last week. So it's kind of interesting to now look back and see what I was thinking because of how that kind of played out and what I would have expected to happen. But, you know, we, we expected that there would be these pockets of resistance to both the Trump administration, organized groups that would support the tr uh, current president that I think we could lump into the term that's kind of gone by the wayside, the alt-right, that are at this point very splintered versions of the same general goals. They, they all have their slight different understandings of the role of government and things like that. But either way, they all kind of try to operate as paramilitias in collusion with the police in some cases, and other times with the goal of starting a civil war by killing cops despite believing, quote unquote, law and order. So it, it can be confusing. And I think that's important to consider. At the end of the day, we are talking about a country of over 300 million people versus an island of, what did I say, 1.5? 1. 1. 5 or 7. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, if you're adding more people, there's going to be more complexity to the system, which in a lot of cases is good. When we're talking about politics, it's not so good. Or civil war, more specifically. So at this point, I don't know whether or not well, actually, that, this is still relevant. I wrote that at this point, we don't know whether or not Trump will actually be stepping down in January. He has the support of all of these right wing groups, despite not having a co uh, coherent ideology. I think that's part of why he has their support and that he hasn't said enough to alienate any of them, but has said enough for them to interpret what they want him to reflect. And I think that's actually really indicative of what happened after this insurrection when he kind of uh, realized it wasn't going to work kind of backed off and some folks were offended by that and others were further galvanized and said even if trump's a piece of shit we've started this we're finishing it and that's the biggest concern right now is not the people that are like fuck trump i can't believe he sold to sell like that and uh, those are probably the most dangerous people of all i'm still not sold that like January 20th is going to go peacefully. Uh, there's a lot that can go wrong. And as of like three hours ago, they arrested a guy in D.C. with like a bunch of guns and 500 rounds ready to go with a pass, an unauthorized pass to the inauguration, which is normal. That's normal country stuff. That's the most American headline I've heard yeah. today. <laughs> we had wanted to get this out in December. Actually, I wanted to get it out in like November and everything else got in the way. And I think it would have been really interesting to hear how we would have talked about this differently. And I guess how now we have more information to talk about the subject area of Trump and Trumpism and the American Civil War that is inevitably coming because no country lives forever. And it's just a matter of whether or not we happen to be the ones who live during that time. No country has ever existed forever. No country is. And we're going to hopefully not be the ones that see it but it doesn't feel that way <laughs> are, we, are we doing takeaways yet almost one last question for you we've kind of talked about a lot of these ideas of what have accelerated the tensions in ireland and in our case we've got donald trump who's kind of the accelerant to like some really deep-seated shit that's been going on in the united states for a long time is there any suggestion we might be looking at more activity like like what happened in ireland that i didn't that we didn't really talk about um, is there something that kind of like stood out as we kind of went through this that you thought would be worth talking about? I'm pretty bad at politics in general, but I, I, I don't know. I, I do think we've sort of been treading water in a lot of the issues that we see in this country 
on, on a on a lot of topics just for so long because we're just disillusioned with it. And I think the tendency really leans towards disenfranchisement and not radicalization. So I, I worry about that. But as as a comedian, you know, I've really enjoyed living through a plague. So why not a civil war? Sure. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you for having um, me. Before we let you go, why don't you plug again so if people have forgotten by now yeah. and they still think that you're funny for some reason wouldn't expect uh, that but okay <laughs> uh what you're working on uh so like i mentioned before every every other saturday my comedy show cabin fever comedy goes live on twitch on comedy hub uh you should just subscribe so that you get the notification when we go live because i have no idea what date it is so i can't tell you when the date of the next one is um, I'm also working on a podcast project, which is going to be a little like this, only less perhaps politically motivated. Uh, it is called Unquarantining History. It'd be a good uh, rinse for yeah. our, our heavy episodes. Yeah. You can go have a laugh. After. I mean, it, it may not be funny. It is It is designed to, to dispel some of the we learn history in isolation. So like you could learn about the Irish Civil War and not connect it to any of the other things that are happening in the world or apply it to another situation. So it is it is trying to tackle some of that. My co-host was was ill last month, so we've been pushing our our recordings back, which has been unfortunate. But it should come out by the end of next month, I promise. Cool. Do you have anything else going on? Any books? Anything like that? I wish, but no. But you can follow me on Twitter or on Instagram at it's Nash Flynn. Okay. Do I get to see any more of your ducks? I know you posted a video of your <laughs> ducks, and we're big duck people here. Well, we did have a duck murder uh, on the farm but that was probably the last interesting thing the ducks really did. They don't like the cold or the snow, so they're just laying low. It wasn't Quacklemore, was it? It wasn't Quacklemore. Quacklemore was our murderer. He mur- I thought it was like an, a different animal. It was like duck on duck crime. It was duck on duck crime. God damn. Quentin the duck passed away. Nature. <laughs> I have I have one main point to take away. Okay. And it's sort of on a positive note because we don't normally end our episode on a positive note. Well, Sort of positive. You're going to end but, this episode on a I mean, positive it's a, note? <laughs> it's a positive negative charge, yeah. if that's what you mean. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. Don't. Last no car bomb joke. No more. <laughs> um, but my, my main takeaway from taking a look back at this whole thing is moving forward with all of the fractured groups. Um, I had mentioned earlier that it seemed like at a point the IRA had stopped asking for things and they were just sort of acting out. Mm -hmm. um, as we move forward in our current situation, I really hope that groups, instead of acting on what makes them different, they focus on the things that they both want and the common ground in order to move the conversation forward. I, I understand that there are emotion involved, there are emotions involved in politics, but if you set that aside and keep your eye on the prize, keep your eye on the objective, you can, we, we can collectively get past all of the bullshit. We just have to stay focused on what we're really asking for and, and sort of take a step back emotionally right. and, and look at things more objectively. And it's a lot easier said than done with all the craziness going on, but you do have to keep that in mind. And I just wanted to say that after we talk about something as heavy as this and apply it to what's potentially and what is happening now. And I mean, yeah. look, if it doesn't go our way or things don't get wrapped up, climate change is going to kill us in like 20 years anyway. Well, that's why we're doing this. Grow, grow a potato. Like, learn potatoes. how to grow a fucking potato <laughs> is my point here. If you enjoyed this episode, go check out the episode we did before this. I think if you're on Spotify or whatever, it'll probably be two episodes before on the Syrian Civil War. It's very similar, but... That's considered kind of our worst case scenario is looking at what's happened there. We looked at this as more of a best case scenario if a civil war were to break out. We've kind of highlighted a lot of the issues that overlap in terms of the United States and our current material conditions, uh, the economic issues, the various relationships that exist between uh, paramilitaries and the U.S. government. And very similarly, we have, we've had a pretty far right wing government kind of trying to steer that ship. And um, that's not really changing with Joe Biden. And lastly, if you did enjoy this, which I'm assuming you did, if you're still listening after probably about an hour and 40 minutes when this is edited, <laughs> go check us out on iTunes. Give us a review. Those reviews help us get recommended more to people. It allows us to get more listeners, which gives us more opportunity to get in new guests. So we can have more folks like Nash Flynn come sit and chat with us and talk about history or farming or whatever the fuck we want to talk about <laughs> i guess so hopefully you guys enjoyed this this is andy 
This is Elliot. Thanks, Nash, for your time and knowledge. Thank you so much. And this is the Poor Pearls Almanac. <laughs>